Thank you for joining us. Tonight we're going to talk about running, running related injuries in our sports medicine center. We're going to start talking about some basic injury patterns in runners, what our initial assessment of those injuries might look like. And then we'll use a case example of a runner with IT band syndrome to talk about some of the things that we're able to do out of the sports medicine center. Talk about what our initial assessment looks like, what we might be able to do um, with ultrasound to look at the appearance of the IT band when someone is injured, what our gait analysis looks like, what initial rehabilitation can look like for patients with IT band syndrome, and then some of our newer treatments that we use to treat the condition. Finally, we'll talk about what return to running looks like, and we'll have some time at the end to do a question and answer session. So when we talk about injury patterns in runners, by and large, we're talking about overuse injuries. So certainly we can see traumatic injuries. Um, for instance, if you try to run through a steeple uh, steeplechase barrier instead of over it, like we see here, uh, but usually those are pretty rare when we're talking about distance runners. And so um, overuse injuries are actually very common and, and up to 80% of runners may experience an overuse injury each year, which is really an astronomically high rate. And the reason for that is the same things that kind of make us better runners also make us injured runners. And there's a delicate balance between our, our stress that we put on our body and that leading to adaptation uh, versus injury. And so we know that if we put stress across the body, it's going gonna, it's gonna to respond. And so that's why we go and we increase our long runs on the weekends. We, we add a few more 400 uh, meter repetitions at the track. Uh, but there's this curve. And, and what this shows is that if we put too much stress um, you know, in a straight load, then that can lead to injury. So we see this injury zone here and this non-injury zone here. Or if we put you know, a moderate stress load but do it too frequently, as we see down here, then that can lead to injury as well. And so the key is to stay um, within a level that's, that's providing enough stress that you get better, that you adapt, but that you don't get injured. And what often happens with endurance runners is that you live somewhere kind of very close to this curve. And so what can happen is over time, you're down in the no injury zone, you're feeling good, but you're kind of gradually building this overall stress and you're inching closer and closer to this curve. But oftentimes, whether you're way down here or right on this injury threshold, you feel pretty good. And then all of a sudden, after a, a certain, certain um, you know, run, you're out, you know, it's nothing overly dramatic, and then you just feel like you got hurt. And that's because you just kind of popped over this injury threshold uh, line, even though your symptoms really have probably been working on this over time. And so whenever we start to talk about what pushes you over that injury stress, uh, we talk about kind of the general risk factors with running, and, and, and this is really with any type, of, um, any type of endurance exercise. And you have intrinsic risk factors and extrinsic risk factors. So your intrinsic risk factors are going to be things you don't have a lot of control over. These are the things that you sort of bring to the table. So your gender, how old you are, different types of anatomic factors is basically how you're put together. And then you look at your extrinsic risk factors, and these are the things that we do have some control over. And so these are going to be things like training variables, so, so your mileage or your pace or intensity, uh, as well as your equipment and your training surfaces. And, and there's a few important things to mention about these extrinsic uh, risk factors. This is what we really spend a lot of time looking at you know, from a sports medicine perspective. So these are the things that we can change. And so with runners, they often will talk about their mileage, but this is not the only variable to consider. So I'll tell you a quick story here, uh, just kind of personally. And so, so we moved uh, to Iowa City about five years ago. And it was in the summertime, and so it was right in the middle of, of uh, racing season. And so my wife was in good shape and kind of came through and was, was monitoring her training and her hours and her miles. And we moved here, and she continued training. And, and later in the summer, she ended up developing a stress fracture in her foot. And we were, you know, trying to look back, how did this happen? And we looked back through her training. She's like, you know, I didn't do anything different. My hours were good. My training stress was fine. But then we noticed that whenever we moved here, it, things were a lot different in where we lived. And so her usual running routes were dramatically hillier than where we had moved from when we were in Minnesota. And so even though everything seemed on paper to be fine, she actually did have a significant change in that amount of stress that she was putting through her body. And, and it was in the form of, uh, of you know, this, this new hill uh, route that she was doing, which kind of funnily now we, we <laughs> name this the stress fracture route whenever we talk about this route that we do. And so you have to consider not only your mileage, but you know, where you're running at, what your pace is, what your you know intensity all these different factors will really fo uh, really you know matter whenever we're looking at where you're at along that stress injury curve and so um, we'll 
whenever we overstress tissues, there are certain types of tissues that will get injured. And so there's, there's different things that you can see kind of all coming from the same overuse. And so one of those is bone. And so we can injure bone, uh, and we call those stress fractures. And so unlike um, you know, a regular fracture where you have a large amount of energy put through that breaks the bone, these are, again, cumulative type of injuries that put stress to the bone more than it can tolerate and eventually can lead to a regular fracture. And so if you come in, there's different ways we can look at these. X-rays are what we've um, traditionally done. And here's a, an example of a stress fracture, which we can see is this dark line on the shin bone or the tibia of somebody who had shin splints that then uh, continued to kind of run through their pain and then progressed onto a full stress fracture. This is an ultrasound image, and we don't use this uh, imaging modality as frequently, but this can sometimes be very helpful to pick up um, fractures about the, around the foot. For example, here we see this metatarsal stress fracture with this crack in the bright white line, which represents the bone. We see some, uh, some blood flow, which is sort of reactive around this, and this increased um, bony callus here, which is the body's response to trying to heal this fracture up. And this is an example of an MRI. And so, so some areas like the hip, we actually need to often move towards MRI to evaluate for bony stress. And so this was a, an ultra-endurance runner um, who had, had, again, changed their um, their, uh, their type of training somewhat and training for more of a road marathon instead of a trail uh, marathons that they were used to. And here we can see this dramatic amount of edema, which is this uh, white area within the, within the bone of the femur or the thigh bone here. This represents swelling and reaction around that bone. And if this athlete continued to run on this, then this could eventually develop into a true fracture. Bones aren't the only things that, that get um, this overload of stress injury. We also can affect tendons as well. And so here's just several examples of what can happen to the Achilles tendon, using that as an example. And so these are all ultrasound images uh, which allow us to, to precisely evaluate these different tendon conditions. Here's an example of a normal Achilles tendon on the top. I'm oh, sorry about that. We'll go back to that slide. So here's a normal Achilles tendon on the top. And we can see these nice uh, linear fibers of the tendon running down to the heel bone or the calcaneus here. And on the bottom, this is an example of a, a typical Achilles tendinosis. And so that's kind of a big word, but basically what that means is just this degenerative swelling of the tendon that we can see here. And so, so I'm sure all of, all of you runners have either unfortunately had this or have known somebody who's had this you know, swollen bump on the back of their, of their uh, Achilles tendon. And this is what it looks like under ultrasound. You can also see different things like blood flow around the area. So this lets us see what we refer to as neovascularity, which is just reaction um, around the tendon tissue. And then occasionally you can see uh, something here that's called peritoneitis. So again, a really big word that basically just means inflammation of the, of the lining of the tendon or the, the outer layer of the tendon. Uh, which often can present rather dramatically. And ultrasound is really helpful here in distinguishing these different characteristics of the tendon because we may treat these, uh, these conditions all very differently, although technically they're still all Achilles tendonitis. Uh, lastly here, just in, in, in uh, general examples, is this is, would be plantar fasciitis or plantar fasciopathy. And so this was a runner that we saw who, who had an acute injury and actually had a partial tear of their plantar fascia um, that then went on to develop chronic symptoms. And we can see here, uh, again, similar to that Achilles, we see a swollen dark area of the plantar fascia. Uh, in this case, we were actually able to do a dynamic examination, uh, which we can see in the video where we're, we're putting some force through the plantar fascia to look at its integrity, uh, to see if there's any laxity there and help us distinguish uh, oftentimes acute from chronic types of injuries. So as you can see, there's lots of tissues that can, that can uh, respond to this overload and can become injured. And um, there's different ways uh, for us to evaluate these. And oftentimes, it starts with simply asking those questions, trying to figure out what those extrinsic risk factors are. And then the next thing we usually do will, will be trying to look at, at what different types of uh, physical things may be going on with this. And so we'll move into a physical exam component next. So if you come into the sports medicine center for a physical therapy examination, due to the fact that you're probably one of those 40 to 80 percent of the people who do get injured while running, we're going to look at several, several variables of the, those extrinsic variables. The first thing that we'll be looking at would be the range of motion testing. And as you can see, there's a lot of things that we will be testing. Um, I think that what this really shows is that there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to running in regards to joints, muscles, and tendons. Um, and trying to really tease out the two biggest variables that we're going to look at in regards to flexibility and range of motion, I think the two primary ones are going to be hip extension and knee extension. With hip extension, if you're unable to extend that hip past neutral uh, while you're running on your stride through, that, uh, that's going to put a lot more stress through your lumbar spine as well as your anterior hip and potentially not allow you to flex your knee uh, the appropriate way uh, at the end of your stride. The other thing that we look at is knee extension. 
If you're unable to fully extend that knee at your mid-stride, that's going to functionally shorten that leg and uh, potentially cause other adaptations up at the lumbar spine and pelvic complex. Uh, in regards to strength testing, as you can see there, we're going to look at the hip, knee, and ankle. Uh, in regards to the hip, uh, abduction is going to be the primary, uh, generally the primary problem that we're looking at as far as lumbar pain, hip pain, or knee pain. Uh, hip abduction is the ability to take the hip away from the body or utilize that stabilizing and single limb stance. Uh, and the other thing that we're going to be looking at is hip extension. Uh, hip extension is going to be your gluteal muscles, and those are going to be the primary movers when it comes to running. In regards to the knee, uh, people who come in with knee pain, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have knee weakness, uh, but that's something that we'll definitely test. And as far as the ankle is concerned, you've got inversion and eversion. That's the, the ability to stabilize that ankle so that you can actually have the forces go up through the body and accelerate or maintain your speed. The other things that we're going to look at are your trunk and lower extremity control. And the way that we're going to do that is with more functional testing. Uh, initially, even something as simple as a single limb stance, uh, it can be very important. If you're unable to stand on, your, on one leg for more than 15 seconds, that's going to indicate that something's not going quite right in that kinetic chain. Uh, after that, we might look at something like a lunge. Uh, a lunge is going to be you know, how far down you can flex, but also people who have hip weakness will have a tendency to deviate towards the midline. And if someone has a knee that crosses their midline, that's going to be an indicator of significant hip weakness. A single limb squat, obviously, we'll look at side to side ratios. And then the star excursion balance test. As you can see down in the corner, we've got an athlete who's uh, doing this multi planar reaching. And what we utilize that for is leg, delay, or leg differences, um, also a leg length to your, uh, your ability to reach. So, uh, typically, if you're unable to reach up to 90% of your leg length, that might indicate you have a higher risk for injury. Then single limb hopping, we're going to look at you know, how far you can go, uh, one leg versus the other, but also there's a qualitative difference. Uh, we're going to look at how you're able to attenuate the stresses of deceleration so that each time you take a step when you're running, you have to be able to stabilize that lower extremity uh, to make sure that you're not having other accessory motion. Um, we also do a gait analysis, and many of you have probably heard a lot about uh, you know, heel strikers versus midfoot strikers versus barefoot running. And barefoot running doesn't necessarily mean you're running around without your shoes on. It's more of a technique. And that barefoot running is more of landing on your forefoot uh, versus your striking initially with your heel. Um, what that's going to have is your foot's going to land just forward of your hip, and it's going to be a shorter stride length and increased heel rise as you come through. Um, potentially, that's going to show, or there's going to be less uh, quad tendon and patellar tendon uh, stresses as well as IT band stresses. But as you can see here, um, the, the absolute forces, the vertical ground reaction force uh, for a rear foot striker versus a midfoot or forefoot striker, they're about the same. But what's more important potentially is this red area here, and that's what you're looking at is the rear foot striker is going to have a very high increase in their vertical ground reaction force. And then they're going to have to attenuate the stress as that uh, they're decelerating the limb and then re-accelerating up to the top of that vertical ground reaction force. Um, coincidentally, if you are going to transition to more of a forefoot or barefoot running technique, uh, you have to dose it appropriately because there is increased stress on your calf. Um, so you can maybe have some of that Achilles tendinopathy that Dr. Hall was talking about earlier if you overdose uh, and you're trying to go to a barefoot running technique. From a gait analysis standpoint, we're going to look at you from behind as well as from a lateral view here. So we have a, a recreational runner uh, who's trying to show you a forefoot versus a heel foot stride or striking. So the person on the left, uh, they, they have more of a forefoot stride. And what you're going to see there is where the foot initially contacts. So uh, on the left, once again, the forefoot strike, uh, and these two are running at the same speed. Um, the forefoot is going to land more just anterior to the hip, whereas on the heel foot striker, it's going to be uh, much more uh, anterior to the hip. And once again, that's going to increase the quad activation, the patellar stresses, um, because you're decelerating that limb before you pull through. So that's some examples of some of the things that we look at at the sports medicine clinic. I want to cone this down to a more specific example, um, working through a case. Um, this is kind of an example case of a 28-year-old, very experienced runner who's been increasing her volume in preparation for a marathon. She's been doing track workouts on an indoor track, and her favorite running trail is currently under repair, so she's been doing more of her long runs on the road, and that road tends to slope away from the middle of the road. She localizes her pain to the lateral aspect of her knee, the outside of her knee, 
Pain is worse when she increases her activity, and it's better with rest, ibuprofen, and when she ices it. Now, this isn't um, a mystery case. The, the elements of the history here really give this away. This is a very good case for someone with iliotibial band syndrome. And most of the time, we're able to figure out what the underlying problem is just from the history. Sometimes we can do some physical exam maneuvers, like looking for some contracture in the iliotibial band like this person has, or looking for some weakness in the hip abduction strength like this person has. So we may want a little bit more information about, um, you know, structurally what's going on with the patient at this point. And so oftentimes we'll do like a combination of x-rays and ultrasound to get some of that information. So x-rays are very good at looking at general bony things, looking at alignment, and picking up things that you're not expecting to find. So in this bottom uh, image, we actually have a, a cyclist who I saw who came in uh, who had, you know, pretty classic iliotibial band syndrome, uh, but his wasn't from any of the other factors that we've been talking about. It was because he has this benign bony tumor that's poking right into his iliotibial band. So x-rays are helpful in picking up these things, strange things that you're not really expecting. Uh, ultrasound gives us a very nice view of the soft tissues, and here is what we would expect to see on uh, the patient that Dr. Peterson just presented. So this person has uh, classic iliotibial band friction syndrome, and what we can see is this area right here, this dark region, and this is just fluid and swelling of the bursal tissue that lies between this iliotibial band and the outside part of the knee. And so this is what we think uh, is, is the most common cause of iliotibial band syndrome, where that um, iliotibial band, so that tissue is rubbing along this area and just causes uh, inflammation in that region, similar to if you get a blister on your heel. There can be some other variants as well, though, and ultrasound does a nice job at letting us evaluate those. Here we see actual degenerative changes in the iliotibial band itself uh, and really no ev evidence of any bursitis. And so this person may end up getting a different treatment uh, than, than the person that has uh, simply a bursal fluid collection. So this might be anybody that you see running downtown in Iowa City. Um, so the things that we're looking for uh, from a rear view here is, uh, you know, a lateral whip with genuvalgus is the way that we term this. And you can see it pretty readily that uh, the foot is rotating out to the side. You're getting a little bit of that lateral motion or the motion to the outside. And then what you see is the knee dropping towards the midline there. And as you can see where her shirt meets her shorts, uh, the hip is dropping and tilting um, in the lateral view. So really what we're looking for here is these malalignments. And so this person easily could be coming in uh, to the clinic for IT band syndrome just due to the fact this puts uh, you know, abnormal forces through the outside of the hip, outside of the knee, and then through the foot. And you can see on that back view here that everything is sort of starting or finishing, if you will, uh, with that lateral hip, okay? Um, so this is a typical gait of someone who might have IT band syndrome. Now earlier we also showed you the, the heel striker gait, and the heel striker gait is going to be someone who also has that force attenuation as they're, as they're heel striking that also might uh, be a little bit more prone to IT band syndrome. So what do we do with a patient like this? Um, as that knee wants to fall to the inside, uh, that's going to be a couple of factors that are there. Number one, a strength factor. So we have to talk about having a little bit more strength at that lateral hip. A typical pro progression might be side-lying hip abduction, so we can isolate that muscle and actually uh, teach someone how to fire and how to activate it appropriately. Because there's a lot of times where you're utilizing your tensor fascia lata muscle, which it attaches into your IT band, and you're creating more stress and force across the outside of that, that lateral femur. Uh, we could progress then to more functional activities like standing abduction, so just standing there and taking your leg away from your side. Uh, and that's really good for both legs, the one that's moving as well as, well as the one that's stabilizing. So it would be something that we do bilaterally. From there, if you want to add more resistance, we can uh, move into more of a side plank situation. So you can load body weight through there. The key for all three of these things is making sure that you're activating the correct muscle, which would be your glute medius, glute max, and glute minimus, um, and having yourself in the appropriate position to do that effectively. The next thing we talk about, and you know, we'd be doing all of these things sort of together, uh, pelvic stabilization. So looking through there, you can do a supine pelvic rotation, leg raises, to reduce some of the the rotation that goes through the pelvis. Standing marching and standing RDLs, uh, we're going to do those things really slow um, because we're working on control around the pelvis and the lumbar spine. And then a static lunge. As I already said, uh, we utilize that uh, to kind of observe the way people move. And you know, if you're in a static lunge holding it for 10 seconds or so, uh, there's some studies out there to suggest that you're really increasing the activation rate of the glute medius uh, the longer that you're holding it. So strength, uh, control, but there's also stretching that's involved. 
Uh, so a dynamic stretch, it can be as simple as a high knee march, kicking out and then doing a lunge step. Uh, one of our PhD students uh, who is now in Wisconsin put together this nice dynamic warm up for running for us. So it's a handout that we give to pretty much everybody, whether you're a runner, or a basketball player, or a soccer player, uh, so that you can get the appropriate warm up prior to, to doing your sport activity. Uh, you can do static stretching following the activity. The big things that we'd try to stretch would be the anterior hip, the outside of the hip, as well as the lateral quads. Uh, you can do a foam roller, and a lot of people uh, like to use that. Um, it's one of those hurts so good kind of things. Um, but what you do have to watch out for is you're not rolling over those bony prominences. So those are the areas that Dr. Hall already showed it has some fluid uh, that's you know, building up in those areas or having some friction problems. So that's not an area that you want to necessarily have that, that increased pain as you're doing the uh, foam rolling. So most patients are going to respond fairly well to the general rehab that Paul just outlined, but there will be some times where we run into some struggles or some hurdles, and so there can be some adjuncts to that conservative uh, treatment that can be very helpful. And so, and the first patient that we showed that just had the, the basic friction syndrome and the bursitis, those often respond fairly well to ultrasound-guided uh, steroid injections. And so this is just an example of us guiding our needle in. This is the iliotibial band here, and we're placing the medication precisely uh, in the region of that bursa, which can decrease some of that swelling and inflammation and often can allow patients really to, to progress through their therapy. Uh, it is important to mention that, that even though most people will feel better for a period of time after a steroid injection, if we don't correct those, uh, those dynamic alignment uh, factors and everything that Paul just went through, oftentimes once that steroid injection wears off, if you're still doing the same stuff you were doing before, you're often going to have a recurrence of the symptoms. So that's why we really do call these adjuncts to those other uh, more, more conservative therapies. You know, this was a patient who you know, probably wasn't going to benefit substantially from a steroid injection due they didn't have inflammation of that bursa. And here we actually decided to target the degenerative tissue itself with a newer treatment called platelet-rich plasma, which is basically just an injection of growth factors that we obtain from your blood in the clinic, um, process down, and then inject back in to try to stimulate a healing response. Uh, very rarely patients just don't get better with any of these things. And, and historically, whenever that was the case, then you were you know, faced with a rather difficult decision to have a fairly invasive uh, open surgical procedure that was going to have um, you know, all the risk associated with, uh, with anesthesia and going to the operating room and a fairly lengthy recovery. And over the past few years, we've been able to develop some very minimally invasive techniques that really mimic what we were able to do previously with surgery. Now in an outpatient setting, just in the clinic, uh, through micro incisions and utilizing ultrasound uh, to guide our surgical instruments. So here we can see just an example we may do for someone who has really refractory IT band syndrome, uh, where we guide a small micro blade in and make some uh, lengthening cuts in the back part of the IT band to loosen that tissue up and actually guide a small little device that allows us to, to remove that thickened inflamed bursal tissue uh, from the body. And again, these can be done uh, really in an outpatient setting. It takes us about an hour to do these things. Uh, it's just under a, a little a local anesthetic injection. We're chatting with you the whole time and you can walk out of clinic uh, that day. This doesn't cure you in a day. You know, there is a bit of a process, um, but, but the recovery is much faster than the, uh, than the traditional uh, open surgical techniques. Eventually, whether we use physical therapy techniques or biomechanic corrections or whether we have to do something more aggressive, eventually the problem gets better. Usually we're able to get people to the point where they want to try to return to running. And there's a few tricks to that. The first is obviously identifying and correcting the training or mechanical errors that led to the problem in the first place. If you just go back to running without trying to um, deal with those things, you run into the same troubles again. Sometimes we have to make careful consideration of the shoe wear and the running surface. Uh, we, we talk a lot about um, gait and how people move and their strength, but oftentimes it's what they're doing uh, to their bodies, how they're running and where they're running that, that drives a lot of this. Once you are returning to run, it's important to do so gradually. You can't just jump back in where you were before. Your body isn't quite ready to handle the same type of load it was before you got injured. And so I usually have people get back to running through very short, very frequent runs. I oftentimes use the example of what we do with our, what we do with our cross-country athletes. When they're returning from a stress-related injury, I'll oftentimes make them get back to doing 10, 10-minute 10 runs a week before we ever start increasing their volume intensity, which is a very small total amount of volume for them. But I think it illustrates the point that doing these very short, very frequent runs is a good way to prepare the body to, to really run for real later on. And it's important to use cross-training techniques to maintain and gain fitness while you can't run. Uh, eventually, people want to return to competition or have running-related goals, and sometimes they can't use their actual running volume to get themselves there. So using cross-training techniques is a good way to gain and build fitness. 
I hope this has been informative um, for, for those of you who have been watching and you've given you a little bit of an idea of what we do at our clinic. We now have some time to um, take some questions. Um, first, first question is for Paul. Uh, when you're seeing someone with a major gait abnormality in the, in the PT clinic, do you spend most of your time trying to uh, correct their gait through strength and through stretching and flexibility, or are you mainly trying to um, change their shoe wear, change the surface that they're running on, and trying to correct some of those extrinsic factors? So I think that we're going to look at all those things sort of in conjunction with each other. Uh, I think that you're not going to change uh, a pain process or, or an injury process with just one of those variables. So we're going to certainly ask in our, you know, in our subjective portion of the evaluation, um, what's, you know, how long have you had your shoes? Where did you get your shoes? Do they fit your feet? Um, have you had foot problems? One of the things that we talk about a lot is actually toenail blackening. So if you have a blackened toenail, that, that's not going to necessarily tell you that your shoe fits wrong, but it might be that the, it's the wrong shoe for you because you're rotating through that, that shoe. So we'll talk about those sort of things. Uh, and then if you have deficits in your strength or your range of motion, those are things that we're going to try to deal with right off the bat. Um, so we can immediately put in a home exercise program or a therapeutic exercise program to deal with those variables. Uh, and then last but not least, we, we certainly have to look at the, you know, do a gait analysis. If, you're, you, know, if you can run uh, at that point in time, uh, we're going to look at the way that you run. Um, and we're going to talk about trying to be linear. So running is a linear sport typically. Uh, however, we have to stabilize through lateral and nonlinear structures. So you know, there will be times uh, when we're looking at that gait then talking about linearity. Maybe we'll talk about uh, doing A drills to start off with, or maybe some skipping and, and having them do that into a mirror so that we can uh, you know, get a more linear sort of gait pattern uh, to reduce some of the rotation, to reduce some of those accessory movement patterns. Next question is from Maderic. Um, this, this listener asks, are there online resources that you can suggest? Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult, I think, now with, with a lot of online resources because there's so much available that's online. And there's a lot of things that, uh, that can be very confusing online. And as you saw, even with something as simple as IT band syndrome, there can be different flavors of it, different variations, and a lot of different things that can cause it. And so, you know, as nice as it is to be able to go online and, and kind of get some programs and things to work on, I do think it's very helpful to, to come into clinic and let somebody at least give you the once over um, to try to, to really identify those risk factors that may be independent to you and try to make a more precise diagnosis and really get you on a good treatment program. I know f for us, you know, our, our therapy philosophy is not to see you as many times as we can. It's really to try to empower you um, to give you an individualized program to get you back out there and going. And I've you know, seen a lot of people who... Uh, have tried to, to find things online and general things and kind of cookie cutter programs that end up not making a lot of progress and I think that's because they haven't necessarily identified those individual variations. Um, so, so it would be great. There are some good online resources that are available uh, for folks to look at to kind of get you started but I think you know, we see enough individual variation in these things that, that I do think you know, one or two visits can really get you along the way and get you moving a lot faster. Next question is for Paul here. Um, I'm going to modify this question a little bit. The question says, do you provide stretching and flexibility exercises and recommendations for runners through your clinics, which, I, which obviously we do. But maybe to modify that a little bit, which do you find is more important, working on strength and control work as someone who's trying to return to running or working on their flexibility? I think that in general, uh, you know, you're going to look at someone and you're going to look at, once again, all those variables. But if you're looking at all those variables, the ones that we find more often are going to be the strength and control issues. Um, people will a lot of times say, I feel like I need to stretch. Uh, and then you actually go through the stretching or you go through their flexibility. And you find out that you know, their flexibility is pretty good. And so you know, what you're thinking is that it's not their ability to move through a range of motion. It's their ability to stabilize and minimize the range of motion, and have mobility of a limb segment on the stability of, of their lumbar spine and pelvis. Next question is for Maderic here. Uh, we oftentimes hear that platelet-rich plasma injections or tenotomy types of treatments are kind of, are, are kind of down the chain or for people who have failed more traditional types of therapies. If those things are so effective for people with bad problems, why don't we use them as our first-line treatments? Yeah, that's a really good question. And 
Uh, and I think a lot of this, we're, st we're still, uh, our knowledge about these things is still evolving. And so where we place them, um, you know, may change over time. But as we went through, a lot of these problems really are, are mechanical problems. And so, you know, a lot of these uh, different treatments, whether it be, you know, steroids that we use for years, now we've moved to some of these fancier things with, with PRP and growth factors and, and even stem cells. Um, there's only so much you can do if you're still placing the same abnormal forces through the area. Um, you're going to have a really high risk for recurrence. So what we're really trying to do is, is fix the underlying problem. And unfortunately, there may be some cases where, where the body needs a little bit of help um, after things have you know, maybe gone wrong long enough or to a certain degree uh, where we need to fix that. But you know, as I mentioned before, if that's all we do and we get them feeling better and we don't correct those factors that led to it in the first place, we're going to be right back where we started ultimately. And so. Um, so we may offer some of those things a little earlier now than we would have, um, you know, five years ago, just because they've been very safe and effective. But at the same time, I really want people to understand uh, what they're going to have to do for this. And a lot of these problems, they really need to take ownership for and, uh, and you know, really learn how to make those corrections. Uh, and, and we're not going to ultimately have a good long-term outcome without that. Great. Our next question is for Paul here. Uh, for first-time distance runners, should they undergo a gait analysis or PT examination prior to their first race? I think it's an excellent question. Um, however, I think for someone to come into a PT clinic, generally, generally it's not preventative medicine to come into the physical therapy clinic. I think there's a lot of great resources within the community. Um, uh, there's, there are run co coaches, triathlete coaches, those sort of things, and they can really talk to you about your gait. If you do want to come in for gait analysis, we, we can certainly do that. Um, uh, typically, once again, we, we primarily run on insurance, uh, so if, if uh, you know, most insurances aren't going to look to pay for a preventative sort of course of treatment. Um, but the other thing to do is just, you, know, you don't necessarily need to have uh, one of us look at you for your gait. Um, as you probably noticed on the young lady that we saw uh, on the video, you could tell something wasn't quite right. Uh, so the treadmill that we've got in the clinic, we've got a mirror setting right up in front of it. And even I'll get on there and sit there and watch and see the linearity of my feet and uh, you know, look at the heel rise and those sort of things. So taking a look at yourself right off the bat, even if you're running downtown and you're going by glass, you know, take a look at yourself and see what it looks like, see if there's any asymmetries. Uh, the other thing that I would tell you is uh, there's a lot of iPod runners out there. So having the, the music on and, and getting going as fast as you can. Uh, sometimes unplug from the iPod and actually listen to your gait. It, it sounds different when you're on gravel versus on concrete versus on grass. But what you should hear is you should hear a symmetrical landing pattern uh, you know, you should have a relative ratio of right versus left when you hit and those sort of things. So just, just unplugging and listening to yourself for a minute can tell you a lot about what's going on with your own gait. Great. Next question is from Derek. How should I pick the shoes that I wear to run in? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And there's a lot of information out there on it. Uh, and, and I'll tell you right now, anyone who see me in clinic, um, you know, always gets me to be surprised by my answer. But but there's really not a good answer to that. And so if you look at, at the evidence and you look at um, you know, really what happens when you put people in an orthotic or an emotion control shoe or in, in something else, you know, people's feet do different things. And even though we may think that you know, based on the science that we know what we're going to do, and we're going to correct pronation, and we hear all those words all the time, that may not actually be the case. And so you know, what I tell people is wear what feels comfortable for you. Uh, and like Paul said, you know, pay attention, kind of get in tune with your body, listen to how how you sound when you run, listen to how your feet, uh, you know, hit the pavement, and just see how it feels to you. So some people will feel, you know, much better in a, in a lighter weight shoe, um, you know, some of these uh, more natural-based running shoes. And other folks just don't do well in those and are going to do better, uh, you know, in, in more of a stability-type shoe. And I think, you know, the good thing about the barefoot revolution was that it really changed what was going on in terms of footwear options. And so, you know, even though the, the barefoot stuff has kind of gone um, somewhat out of vogue to this max cushion thing now, I think it's great because patients can go in, and, you know, runners can go in now, and you can get anything from, you know, from a Vibram five-finger, you know, barefoot shoe um, all the way up to, to, you know, a max cushion neutral shoe to the old, you know, stability shoe with, with motion control. And so now there's a lot of, you know, a lot of options out for folks. And I think, you know, by and large, a lot of it is what's going to feel comfortable on your feet uh, more than anything. And, uh, you know, and a lot of the running uh, stores will, you know, have treadmills and can kind of look at things and, and, and help you along that process. But I will tell you, there's no magic shoe and there is no magic formula for everybody's foot. 
Thanks, Madarek. And thank you guys for joining us tonight. Um, this has been you know, a quick whirlwind tour of running. Um, there's obviously a, a, a lot to say about running. We were able, only able to scratch the surface. If you have more questions, feel free to contact us or come into clinic. If you have running-related injuries or would like to talk about your training, we're available at the Sports Medicine Center. Um, we'll be happy to see you. Thanks for joining us. Please keep an eye out for an email from us within the next two days, which is a program survey. You will also receive a follow-up email with information and links from today's presentations. Thank you again for attending the webinar, and we look forward to seeing you at future programs.